The Call to Arms Patrick Henry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Call to Arms by Patrick Henry This speech was delivered March 20th 1775, in the Virginia Convention. Although the measures he advocated sent a shock of consternation through the conservative assembly and caused them to oppose the resolution with all their power, yet all objections were swept away and the measures were adopted. Mr. President, it is natural for a man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of the number of those who having eyes see not, and having ears hear not, the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last ten years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the house. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. It will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our lands. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love. Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sir, what means this martial array? if its purpose be not to force us to submission. Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the last ten years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? 
nothing. We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, but it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? What terms shall we find which have not been already exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves longer. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm that is now coming on. We have petitioned. We have remonstrated. We have supplicated. We have prostrated ourselves before the throne and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded, and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne in vain, after these things, may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve, inviolate those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained. We must fight. I repeat it, sir, we must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts, is all that is left to us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week, or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed, and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs, and hugging the delusive phantom of hope, until our enemies have bound us hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty, and in such a country as that which we possess, are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations, and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone, it is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat it, sir, let it come. It is vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. 
the next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. End of The Call to Arms by Patrick Henry Recording by Robert Scott, Mojo Move 411.com, M O J O M O V E 411.com. September the 9th, 2007. A Free Man's Worship by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To Dr. Faustus, in his study, Mephistopheles told the history of the creation, saying, quote, The endless praises of the choirs of angels had begun to grow wearisome. For after all, did he not deserve their praise? Had he not given them endless joy? Would it not be more amusing to obtain undeserved praise, to be worshipped by beings whom he tortured? He smiled inwardly and resolved that the great drama should be performed. For countless ages the hot nebula whirled aimlessly through space. At length it began to take shape. The central mass threw off planets, the planets cooled, boiling seas and burning mountains heaved and tossed, from black masses of cloud hot sheets of rain deluged the barely solid crust. And now the first germ of life grew in the depths of the ocean, and developed rapidly in the fructifying warmth into vast forest trees, huge ferns springing from damp mold, sea monsters breeding, fighting, devouring, and passing away. And from the monsters, as the play unfolded itself, man was born, with the power of thought, the knowledge of good and evil, and the cruel thirst for worship. And man saw that all is passing in this mad, monstrous world, and that all is struggling to snatch at any cost a few brief moments of life before death's inexorable decree. And man said, There is a hidden purpose could we but fathom it. And the purpose is good, for we must reverence something, and in the visible world there is nothing worthy of reverence. And man stood aside from the struggle, resolving that God intended harmony to come out of chaos by human efforts. And when he followed the instincts which God had transmitted to him from his ancestry of beats of prey, he called it sin, and asked God to forgive him. But he doubted whether he could be justly forgiven, until he invented a divine plan by which God's wrath was to have been appeased. And seeing the present was bad, he made it yet worse, that thereby the future might be better. And he gave God thanks for the strength that enabled him to forego even the joys that were possible. And God smiled. And when he saw that man had become perfect in renunciation and worship, he sent another son through the sky, which crashed into man's son, and all returned again to Nebula. Yes, he murmured, it was a good play. I will have it performed again. Such an outline, but even more purposeless, more void of meaning, is the world which science presents for our belief. Amid such a world, if anywhere, our ideals henceforward must find a home. That man is the product of causes which had no provision of the end they were achieving, 
that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation thenceforth be safely built. How, in such an alien and inhuman world, can so powerless a creature as man preserve his aspirations untarnished? A strange mystery it is that nature, omnipotent but blind, in the revolutions of her secular hurryings through the abysses of space, has brought forth at last a child, subject still to her power but gifted with sight, with knowledge of good and evil, with the capacity of judging all the works of his unthinking mother. In spite of death, the mark and seal of the parental control, man is yet free, during his brief years, to examine, to criticize, to know, and in imagination to create. To him alone, in the world with which he is acquainted, this freedom belongs, and in this lies his superiority to the restless forces that control his outward life. The savage, like ourselves, feels the oppression of his impotence before the powers of nature. But having in himself nothing that he respects more than power, he is willing to prostrate himself before his gods without inquiring whether they are worthy of his worship. Pathetic and very terrible is the long history of cruelty and torture, of degradation and human sacrifice, endured in the hope of placating a jealous gods. Surely, the trembling believer thinks, when what is most precious has been freely given, their lust for blood must be appeased, and more will not be required. The religion of Malach, as such creeds may be generically called, is in essence the cringing submission of the slave, who dare not, even in his heart, allow the thought that his master deserves no adulation. Since the independence of ideals is not yet acknowledged, power may be freely worshipped and receive an unlimited respect, despite its wanton infliction of pain. But gradually, as morality grows bolder, the claim of the ideal world begins to be felt, and worship, if it is not to cease, must be given to gods of another kind than those created by the savage. Some, though they feel the demands of the ideal, will still consciously reject them, still urging that naked power is worthy of worship. Such is the attitude inculcated in God's answer to Job out of the whirlwind. The divine power and knowledge are paraded, but of divine goodness there is no hint. Such also is the attitude of those who, in our day, base their morality upon the struggle for survival, maintaining that the survivors are necessarily the fittest. But others, not content with an answer so repugnant to the moral sense, will adopt the position which we have become accustomed to regard as specifically religious, maintaining that, in some hidden manner, the world of fact is really harmonious with the world of ideas. Thus, man creates God, all-powerful and all-good, the mystic unity of what is and what should be. But the world of fact, after all, is not good. And, in submitting our judgment to it, there is an element of slavishness from which our thoughts must be purged, by freeing him as far as possible from the tyranny of non-human power. When we have realized that power is largely bad, that man with his knowledge of good and evil is but a helpless atom in a world which has no knowledge, the choice is again presented to us. Shall we worship force, or shall we worship goodness? Shall our God exist and be evil, or shall he be recognized as the creation of our own conscience? The answer to this question is very momentous and affects profoundly our whole morality. The worship of force, to which Carlyle and Nietzsche and the creed of militarism have accustomed us, is the result of failure to maintain our own ideals against a hostile universe. It is itself 
a prostrate submission to evil, a sacrifice of our best to Moloch. If strength indeed is to be respected, let us respect rather the strength of those who refuse that false, quote, recognition of facts, which fails to recognize that facts are often bad. Let us admit that in the world we know there are many things that would be better otherwise, and that the ideals to which we do and must adhere are not realized in the realm of matter. Let us preserve our respect for truth, for beauty, for the ideal of perfection which life does not permit us to attain, though none of these things meet with the approval of the unconscious universe. If power is bad, as it seems to be, let us reject it from our hearts. In this lies man's true freedom, in determination to worship only the God created by our own love of the good, to respect only the heaven which inspires the insight of our best moments. In action, in desire, we must submit perpetually to the tyranny of outside forces. But in thought, in aspiration, we are free, free from our fellow men, free from the petty planet on which our bodies impotently crawl, free even while we live from the tyranny of death. Let us learn, then, that the energy of faith which enables us to live constantly in the vision of the good, and let us descend, in action, into the world of fact, with that vision always before us. When first the opposition of fact and ideal grows fully visible, a spirit of fiery revolt, of fierce hatred of the gods, seems necessary to the assertion of freedom. To defy with Promethean constancy a hostile universe, to keep its evil always in view, always actively hated, to refuse no pain that the malice of power can invent, appears to be the duty of all who will not bow before the inevitable. But indignation is still a bondage, for it compels our thoughts to be occupied with an evil world. And in the fierceness of desire from which rebellion springs, there is a kind of self-assertion which it is necessary for the wise to overcome. Indignation is a submission of our thoughts, but not of our desires. The stoic freedom in which wisdom consists is found in the submission of our desires, but not of our thoughts. From the submission of our desires springs the virtue of resignation. From the freedom of our thoughts springs the whole world of art and philosophy, and the vision of beauty by which, at last, we half reconquer the reluctant world. But the vision of beauty is possible only to unfettered contemplation, to thoughts not weighted by the load of eager wishes. And thus freedom comes only to those who no longer ask of life that it shall yield them any of those personal goods that are subject to the mutations of time. Although the necessity of renunciation is evidence of the existence of evil, yet Christianity in preaching it has shown a wisdom exceeding that of the Promethean philosophy of rebellion. It must be admitted that, of the things we desire some, though they prove impossible, are yet real goods. Others, however, as ardently longed for, do not form part of a fully purified ideal. The belief that what must be renounced is bad, though sometimes false, is far less often false than untamed passion supposes, and the creed of religion, by providing a reason for proving that it is never false, has been the means of purifying our hopes by the discovery of many austere truths. But there is, in resignation, a further good element. Even real goods, when they are unattainable, ought not to be fretfully desired. To every man comes, sooner or later, the great renunciation. For the young, there is nothing unattainable. A good thing desired, with the whole force of a passionate will, and yet impossible, is to them not credible. Yet, by death, by illness, by poverty, or by the voice of duty, we must learn, each one of us, that the world was not made for us, and that, however beautiful may be the things we crave for, fate may nevertheless forbid them. It is the part of courage, when misfortune comes, to bear without repining the ruin of our hopes, to turn away our thoughts from vain regrets. This degree of submission to power is not only just and right, it is the very gate of wisdom. But passive renunciation is not the whole wisdom, for not by renunciation alone can we build a temple for the worship of our own ideals. Haunting foreshadowings of the temple appear in the realm of imagination, in music, in architecture, 
in the untroubled kingdom reason and in the golden sunset magic of lyrics, where beauty shines and glows, remote from the touch of sorrow, remote from the fear of change, remote from the failures and disenchantments of the world of fact. In the contemplation of these things, the vision of heaven will shape itself in our hearts, giving at once a touchstone to judge the world about us, and an inspiration by which to fashion to our needs whatever is not incapable of serving as a stone in the sacred temple. Except for those rare spirits that are born without sin, there is a cavern of darkness to be traversed before that temple can be entered. The gate of the cavern is despair, and its floor is paved with the gravestones of abandoned hopes. There self must die. There the eagerness, the greed of untamed desire must be slain, for only so can the soul be freed from the empire of fate. But out of the cavern of the gate of renunciation leads again to the daylight of wisdom, by whose radiance a new insight, a new joy, a new tenderness, shine forth to gladden the pilgrim's heart. When, without the bitterness of impotent rebellion, we have learnt both to resign ourselves to the outward rule of fate and to recognize that the non-human world is unworthy of our worship, it becomes possible at last so to transform and refashion the unconscious universe, so to transmute it in the crucible of imagination, that a new image of shining gold replaces the old idol of clay. In all the multiform facts of the world, in the visual shape of trees and mountains and clouds, in the events of the life of man, even in the very omnipotence of death, the insight of creative idealism can find the reflection of a beauty which its own thoughts first made. In this way, mind asserts its subtle mastery over the thoughtless forces of nature. The more evil the material with which it deals, the more thwarting to untrained desire, the greater is its achievement in inducing the reluctant rock to yield up its hidden treasures, the prouder its victory in compelling the opposing forces to swell the pageant of its triumph. Of all the arts, tragedy is the proudest, the most triumphant, for it builds its shining citadel in the very center of the enemy's country, on the very summit of his highest mountain. From its impregnable watchtowers, his camps and arsenals, his columns and forts are all revealed. Within its walls, the free life continues, while the legions of death and pain and despair and all the servile captains of tyrant fate afford the burghers of that dauntless city new spectacles of beauty. Happy those sacred ramparts, thrice happy the dwellers on that all-seeing eminence. Honor to those brave warriors who, through countless ages of warfare, have preserved for us the priceless heritage of liberty and have kept undefiled by sacrilegious invaders the home of the unsubdued. But the beauty of tragedy does not but make visible a quality which, in more or less obvious shapes, is present always and everywhere in life. In the spectacle of death, in the endurance of intolerable pain, and in the irrevocableness of a vanished past, there is sacredness, an overpowering awe, a feeling of the vastness, the depth, the inexhaustible mystery of existence, in which, as by some strange marriage of pain, the sufferer is bound to the world by bonds of sorrow. In these moments of insight, we lose all eagerness of temporary desire, all struggling and striving for petty ends, all care for the little trivial things that, to a superficial view, make up the common life of day to day we see surrounding the narrow raft illuminated by the flickering light of human comradeship, the dark ocean on whose rolling waves we toss for a brief hour. From the great night without, a chill blast breaks in upon our refuge. All the loneliness of humanity amid hostile forces is concentrated upon the individual soul, which must struggle alone with what of courage it can command against the whole weight of a universe that cares nothing for its hopes and fears. Victory, in this struggle with the powers of darkness is the true baptism into glorious company of heroes, the true initiation into the overmastering beauty of human existence. From that awful encounter of the soul with the outer world, renunciation, wisdom, and charity are born. And with their birth, a new life begins. 
to take into the inmost shrine of the soul the irresistible forces whose puppets we seem to be, death and change, the irrevocableness of the past, and the powerless of man before in the blind hurry of the universe from vanity to vanity, to feel these things and know them is to conquer them. This is the reason why the past has such magical power. The beauty of its motionless and silent pictures is like the enchanted purity of late autumn, when the leaves, though one breath would make them fall, still glow against the sky in golden glory. The past does not change or strive. Like Duncan, after life's fitful fever, it sleeps well. What was eager and grasping, what was petty and transitory, has faded away. The things that were beautiful and eternal shine out of it like stars in the night. Its beauty to a soul not worthy of it is unendurable. But to a soul which has conquered fate, it is the key of religion. The life of man viewed outwardly is but a small thing in comparison with the forces of nature. The slave is doomed to worship time and fate and death because they are greater than anything he finds in himself and because all his thoughts are of things which they devour. But great as they are, to think of them greatly, to feel their passionless splendor is greater still. And such thought makes us free men. We no longer bow before the inevitable and oriental subjection, but we absorb it and make it a part of ourselves. To abandon the struggle for private happiness, to expel all eagerness of temporary desire, to burn with passion for eternal things, this is emancipation, and this is the free man's worship. And this liberation is effected by a contemplation of fate, for fate itself is subdued by the mind which leaves nothing to be purged by the purifying fire of time. United with his fellow men by the strongest of all ties, the tie of a common doom, the free man finds that a new vision is with him always, shedding over every daily task the light of love. The life of man is a long march through the night, surrounded by invisible foes, tortured by weariness and pain, towards a goal that few can hope to reach, and where none may tarry long. One by one, as they march, our comrades vanish from our sight, seized by the silent orders of omnipotent death. Very brief is the time in which we can help them, in which their happiness or misery is decided. Be it ours to shed sunshine on their path, to lighten their sorrows by the balm of sympathy, to give them the pure joy of a never-tiring affection, to strengthen failing courage, to instill faith in hours of despair. Let us not weigh in grudging scales their merits and demerits, but let us think only of their need, of the sorrows, the difficulties, perhaps the blindnesses, that make the misery of their lives. Let us remember that they are fellow sufferers in the same darkness, actors in the same tragedy with ourselves. And so, when their day is over, when their good and their evil have become eternal by the immortality of the past, be it ours to feel that, where they suffered, where they failed, no deed of ours was the cause, but wherever a spark of the divine fire kindled in their hearts, we were ready with encouragement, with sympathy, with brave words in which high courage glowed. Brief and powerless is a man's life. On him and all his race the slow, sure doom falls pitiless and dark. Blind to good and evil, reckless of destruction, omnipotent matter rolls on its relentless way. For man, condemned today to lose his dearest, tomorrow himself to pass through the gate of darkness, it remains only to cherish, ere yet the blow falls, the lofty thoughts that ennoble his little day. Disdaining the coward terrors of the slave of fate, to worship at the shrine that his own hands have built, undismayed by the empire of chance, to preserve a mind free from the wanton tyranny that rules his outward life, proudly defiant of the irresistible forces that tolerate for a moment his knowledge and his condemnation, to sustain alone a weary but unyielding atlas, the world that his own ideals have fashioned despite the trampling march of unconscious power. End a Free Man's Worship by Bertrand Russell Read by M. L. Cohen 
www.mojomove411.com, Cleveland, Ohio, August 2007. Funeral Oration of Pericles, excerpt from Chapter 6, History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, translated by Richard Crawley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the same winter, the Athenians gave a funeral at the public cost to those who had first fallen in this war. It was a custom of their ancestors, and in the manner of it as follows. Three days before the ceremony, the bones of the dead are laid out in the tent which has been erected, and their friends bring to their relatives such offerings as they please. In the funeral procession, cypress coffins are borne in cars, one for each tribe, the bones of the deceased being placed in the coffin of their tribe. Among these is carried one empty bier decked for the missing, that is, for those whose bodies could not be recovered. Any citizen or stranger who pleases joins in the procession, and the female relatives are there to wail at the burial. The dead are laid in the public sepulchre in the beautiful suburb of the city, in which those who fall in war are always buried, with the exception of those slain at Marathon, who, for their singular and extraordinary valor, were interred on the spot where they fell. After the bodies have been laid in the earth, a man chosen by the state, of approved wisdom and eminent reputation, pronounces over them an appropriate panegyric, after which all retire. Such is the manner of the burying, and throughout the whole of the war, whenever the occasion arose, the established custom was observed. Meanwhile, these were the first that had fallen, and Pericles, son of Xanthippus, was chosen to pronounce their eulogium. When the proper time arrived, he arrived from the sepulchre to an elevated platform in order to be heard by as many of the crowd as possible, and spoke as follows. Most of my predecessors in this place have commended him who made this speech part of the law, telling us that it is well that it should be delivered at the burial of those who fall in battle. For myself, I should have thought that the worth which had displayed itself in deeds would be sufficiently rewarded by honors also shown by deeds, such as you now see in this funeral prepared at the people's cost. And I could have wished that the reputations of many brave men were not to be imperiled in the mouth of a single individual, to stand or fall according as he spoke well or ill. For it is hard to speak properly upon a subject where it is even difficult to convince your hearers that you are speaking the truth. On the one hand, the friend who is familiar with every fact of the story may think that some point has not been set forth with that fullness which he wishes and knows it to deserve. On the other, he who is a stranger to the matter may be led by envy to suspect exaggeration if he hears anything above his own nature. For men can endure to hear others praised only so long as they can severally persuade themselves of their own ability to equal the actions recounted. When this point is passed, envy comes in, and with it, incredulity. However, since our ancestors have stamped this custom with their approval, it becomes my duty to obey the law and to try and satisfy your several wishes and opinions as best I may. I shall begin with our ancestors. It is both just and proper that they should have the honor of the first mention on occasion like the present. They dwelt in the country without breaking the succession from generation to generation, and handed it down free to the present time by their valor. And if our more remote ancestors deserve praise, much more do our own fathers, who added to their inheritance the empire which we now possess, and spared no pains to be able to leave their acquisitions to us of the present generation. Lastly, there are few parts of our dominions that have not been augmented by those of us here, who are still more or less in the vigor of life, while the mother country has been furnished by us with everything that can enable her to depend on her own resources, whether for war or for peace. That part of our history which tells of the military achievements which gave us our several possessions, or of the ready valor with which either we or our fathers stemmed the tide of Hellenic or foreign aggression, 
is a theme too familiar to my hearers for me to dilate on, and I shall therefore pass it by. But what was the road by which we reached our position? What the form of government under which our greatness grew? What the national habits out of which it sprang? These are the questions which I may try to solve before I proceed to my panegyric upon these men, since I think this to be a subject upon which on the present occasion a speaker may properly dwell, and to which the whole assemblage, whether citizens or foreigners, may listen with advantage. Our Constitution does not copy the laws of neighboring states. We are rather a pattern to others than imitators ourselves. Its administration favors the many instead of the few. This is why it is called a democracy. If we look to the laws, they afford equal justice to all in their private differences. If no social standing, advancement in public life falls to reputation for capacity, class considerations not being allowed to interfere with merit, nor again does poverty bar the way. If a man is able to serve the state, he is not hindered by the obscurity of his condition. The freedom which we enjoy in our government extends also to our ordinary life. There, far from exercising a jealous surveillance over each other, we do not feel called upon to be angry with our neighbor for doing what he likes, or even to indulge in those injurious looks which cannot fail to be offensive, although they inflict no positive penalty. But all this ease in our private relations does not make us lawless as citizens. Against this fear is our chief safeguard, teaching us to obey the magistrates and the laws, particularly such as regard to protection of the injured, whether they are actually on the statute book or belong to that code which, although unwritten, yet cannot be broken without acknowledged disgrace. Further, we provide plenty of means for the mind to refresh itself from business. We celebrate games and sacrifices all the year round, and the elegance of our private establishments forms a daily source of pleasure and helps to banish the spleen while the magnitude of our city draws the produce of the world into our harbor, so that to the Athenian, the fruits of other countries are as familiar a luxury as those of his own. If we turn to our military policy, there also we differ from our antagonists. We throw open our city to the world, and never by alien acts exclude foreigners from any opportunity of learning or observing although the eyes of an enemy may occasionally profit by our liberality, trusting less in system and policy than to the native spirit of our citizens, while in education, where our rivals from their very cradles by a painful discipline seek after manliness, at Athens we live exactly as we please, and yet are just as ready to encounter every legitimate danger. In proof of this, it may be noticed that the Lacedaemonians do not invade our country alone, but bring with them all their confederates, while we Athenians advanced unsupported into the territory of a neighbor, and fighting upon a foreign soil usually vanquished with ease men who were defending their homes. Our united force was never yet encountered by any enemy, because we have at once to attend to our marine and to dispatch our citizens by land upon a hundred different services, so that, wherever they engage some such fraction of our strength, a success against a detachment is magnified into a victory over the nation, and a defeat into a reverse suffered at the hands of our entire people. And yet, if with habits not of labor but of ease, and courage not of art but of nature, we are still willing to encounter danger, we have the double advantage of escaping the experience of hardships in anticipation and of facing them in the hour of need as fearlessly as those who are never free from them. Nor are these the only points in which our city is worthy of admiration. We cultivate refinement without extravagance and knowledge without effeminacy. Wealth we employ more for use than for show and place the real disgrace of poverty not in owning to the fact, but in declining to struggle against it. Our public men have, besides politics, their private affairs to attend to, and our ordinary citizens though occupied with the pursuits of industry, are still fair judges of public matters. For unlike any other nation, regarding him who takes no part in these duties not as unambitious, but as useless, we Athenians are able to judge at all events if we cannot originate, and, instead of looking on discussion as a stumbling block in the way of action, we think it an indispensable preliminary to any wise action at all. Again, 
in our enterprises, we present the singular spectacle of daring and deliberation, each carried its highest point, and both united in the same persons. Although usually decision is the fruit of ignorance, hesitation of reflection. But the palm of courage will surely be a judge most justly to those who best know the difference between hardship and pleasure, and yet are never tempted to shrink from danger. In generosity, we are equally singular, acquiring our friends by conferring, not by receiving favors. Yet, of course, the doer of the favor is a firmer friend of the two, in order by continued kindness to keep the recipient in his debt, while the debtor feels less keenly from the very consciousness that the return he makes will be a payment, not a free gift. And it is only the Athenians who, fearless of consequences, can further benefits not from calculations of expediency, but in the confidence of liberality. In short, I say that as a city we are a school of Hellas, while I doubt if the world can produce a man who, where he has only himself to depend upon, is equal to so many emergencies, and graced by so happy a versatility as the Athenian. And that this is no mere boast thrown out for the occasion, but a plain matter of fact, the power of the state acquired by these habits proves. For Athens alone, for Athens alone of her contemporaries is found when tested to be greater than her reputation, and alone gives no occasion to her assailants to blush at the antagonist by whom they have been worsted, or to her subjects to question her title by merit to rule. Rather, the admiration of the present and succeeding ages will be ours, since we have not left our power without witness, but have shown it by mighty proofs. And far from needing a homer for our panegyrist, or other of his craft whose verses might charm for the moment, only for the impression which they gave to melt at the touch of fact, we have forced every sea and land to be the highway of our daring, and everywhere, whether for evil or for good, have left imperishable monuments behind us. Such is the Athens for which these men, in the assertion of their resolve not to lose her, nobly fought and died and well may every one of their survivors be ready to suffer in her cause. Indeed, if I have dwelt at some length upon the character of our country, it has been to show that our stake in the struggle is not the same as theirs who have no such blessings to lose, and also that the panegyric of the men over whom I am now speaking might be by definite proofs established. That panegyric is now in a great measure complete, for the Athens that I have celebrated is only what the heroism of these and their like have made her, men whose fame, unlike that of most Hellenes, will be found to be only commensurate with their deserts. And if a test of worth be wanted, it is to be found in their closing scene, and this not only in cases in which it set the final seal upon their merit, but also in those in which it gave the first intimation of their having any. For there is justice in the claim that steadfastness in his country's battles should be a cloak to cover a man's other imperfections, since the good action has blotted out the bad, and his merit as a citizen more than outweighed his demerits as an individual. But none of these allowed either wealth with its prospect of future enjoyment to unnerve his spirit, or poverty with its hope of a day of freedom and riches to tempt him to shrink from danger. No, holding that vengeance upon their enemies was more to be desired than any personal blessings, and reckoning this to be the most glorious of hazards, they joyfully determined to accept the risk, to make sure of their vengeance, and to let their wishes wait. And while committing to hope the uncertainty of final success in the business before them, they thought fit to act boldly and trust in themselves. Thus choosing to die resisting, rather than to live submitting, they fled only from dishonor but met danger face to face, and after one brief moment, while at the summit of their fortune, escaped not from their fear, but from their glory. So died these men, as became Athenians. You, their survivors, must determine to have as unfaltering a resolution in the field, though you may pray that it may have a happier issue and not contented with ideas derived only from words of the advantages which are bound up with the defense of your country, though these would furnish a valuable text to a speaker even before an audience so alive to them as the present, you must yourselves realize the power of Athens and feed your eyes upon her from day to day, till
till love of her fills your hearts. And then, when all her greatness shall break upon you, you must reflect that it was by courage, sense of duty, and a keen feeling of honor and action that men were enabled to win all this, and that no personal failure in an enterprise could make them consent to deprive their country of their valor, but they laid it at her feet as the most glorious contribution that they could offer. For this offering of their lives, made in common by them all, they each of them individually received that renown which never grows old, and for a sepulcher not so much that in which their bones have been deposited, but that noblest of shrines wherein the glory is laid up to be eternally remembered upon every occasion on which the deed or story can call for its commemoration. For heroes have the whole earth for their tomb, and in lands far from their own, where the column with its epitaph declares it, there is enshrined in every breast a record unwritten with no tablet to preserve it, except that of the heart. These take as your model and, judging happiness to be the fruit of freedom and freedom of valor, never decline the dangers of war. For it is not the miserable that would most justly be unsparing of their lives. These have nothing to hope for. It is rather they to whom continued life may bring reverses as yet unknown, and to whom a fall, if it came, would be most tremendous in its consequences. And surely, to a man of spirit, the degradation of cowardice must be immeasurably more grievous than the unfelt death which strikes him in the midst of his strength and patriotism. Comfort, therefore, not condolence, is what I have to offer to the parents of the dead who may be here. Numberless are the chances to which, as they know, the life of man is subject. But fortunate indeed are they who draw for their lot a death so glorious as that which has caused your mourning, and to whom life has been so exactly measured as to terminate in the happiness in which it has been passed. Still, I know that this is a hard saying, especially when those are in question of whom you will constantly be reminded by seeing in the homes of others blessings of which once you also boasted. For grief is felt not so much for the want of what we have never known, as for the loss of that to which we have been long accustomed. Yet you, who are still of an age to beget children, must bear up in the hope of having others in their stead. Not only will they help you to forget those whom you have lost, but will be to the state at once a reinforcement and a security. For never can a fair or just policy be expected of the citizen who does not, like his fellows, bring to the decisions the interest and apprehensions of a father. While those of you who have passed your prime must congratulate yourselves with the thought that the best part of your life was fortunate, and that the brief span that remains will be cheered by the fame of the departed, for it is only the love of honor that never grows old. And honor it is, not gain, as some would have it, that rejoices the heart of age and helplessness. Turning to the sons or brothers of the dead, I see an arduous struggle before you. When a man is gone, all are wont to praise him. And should your merit be ever so transcendent, you will still find it difficult not merely to overtake, but even to approach their renown. The living have envy to contend with, while those who are no longer in our path are honored with a goodwill into which rivalry does not enter. On the other hand, if I must say anything on the subject of female excellence to those of you who will now be in widowhood, it will be all comprised in this brief exhortation. Great will be your glory in not falling short of your natural character, and greatest will be hers who is least talked of among the men, whether for good or for bad. My task is now finished. I have performed it to the best of my ability, and in word at least, the requirements of the law are now satisfied. If deeds be in question, those who are here interred have received part of their honors already. And for the rest, their children will be brought up till manhood at public expense. The state thus offers a valuable prize as the garland of victory in this race of valor for the reward both of those who have fallen 
and their survivors. And where the rewards for merit are greatest, there are found the best citizens. And now that you have brought to a close your lamentations for your relatives, you may depart. End Funeral Oration of Pericles from Thucydides, History of the Peloponnesian War Read by M. L. Cohen, mojomove411.com That's M-O-J-O-M-O-V-E dot 411.com Cleveland, Ohio, September 2007Miseries from Autumn Leaves by Various Authors, edited by Anne Wales Abbott, read by Brian Ness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Misery number one. Did you ever try to eat a peach elegantly and gracefully? Of course you have. Show me a man who has not tried the experiment when under the restraint of human surveillance, and I shall look upon him as a curiosity. There is no fruit, certainly, which has so fair and alluring an exterior, but few content themselves with feasting their eyes upon it. How fresh and ripe it looks as it lies upon the plate, with its rosy cheek turned temptingly upward! How cool and soft is the downy skin to the touch! and the fragrance so suggestive of its rich, delicious flavor, who can resist? Ah, unhappy white, bitterly you shall repent your rashness. Any other fruit can be eaten with comparative ease and politeness. A peach was evidently intended only to be looked at, or enjoyed beneath your own tree, where no eye may watch and criticize your motions. I see you, in imagination, at a party, standing in the middle of the room, plate in hand, regarding your peach, as if it were some great natural curiosity. A sudden jog of your elbow compels you to a succession of most dexterous balancings, as your heavy peach rolls from side to side, knocks down your knife, and threatens to plunge after it when you stoop to regain it. You look distractedly round for a table, but all are occupied. Even the corner of the mantel-shelf holds a plate, and you enviously see the owner thereof, leaning carelessly against the chimney, and looking placidly round upon his less fortunate companions. You glance at the different groups to see if any one else is in your most unenviable predicament. Ah, yes, yonder stands a gentleman worse off yet, for in addition to your perplexities he is talking with a young, laughing girl— who is watching his movements with a merry twinkle in her bright eyes. He evidently wishes to astonish her by his dexterity and disappoint her roguish expectations. He holds his plate firmly in his left hand and proceeds at once to cut his peach in halves. Deuce take the blunt silver knife. The tough skin resists its pressure. The knife and plate clash loudly together. The peach is bounding and rolling at the very feet of the young lady who is in an ecstasy of laughter. Ah, she herself has no small resemblance to a peach, fair, beautiful, and attractive without, and, I sadly fear, with a hard heart beneath. Are you yet more miserable than before? Turn then to yonder sober-looking gentleman, who certainly seems sufficiently composed to perform the difficult maneuver. He has the advantage of a table, to be sure, but that is not everything. He begins right by deliberately removing the woolly skin. Now he lays the slippery peach in his plate and makes a plunge at it with his knife. A sharp, prolonged screech across the plate salutes the ears of all the bystanders, and a fine slice of the juicy pulp is flung unceremoniously into the face of the gentleman opposite, who certainly does not look very grateful for the unexpected gift. Everyone, of course, has seen the awkward accident. Oh, no, that pretty animated girl upon the sofa is much too pleasantly engaged, that is evident, to be watching her neighbors, playing carelessly with her fan and casting many sparkling glances upward at the two gentlemen who are vying with each other in their gallant attentions 
she has enough to do without noticing other people. She is happily unconscious of the mortification which is in store for her, or willfully shuts her eyes to the peril. Alas, her hand is resting, even now, upon the destroyer of all her present enjoyment, the beautiful, fragrant, treacherous peach. With a nonchalance really shocking to the anxious beholder, she raises it and breaks it open, talking the while and scarcely bestowing a thought upon what she is about. Dexterously done, but, a oh, whole luckless maiden, the fruit is ripe and rich and juicy, and the running drops fall not into her plate, but upon the delicate folds of her dress. The merry repartee dies away upon her lips as she becomes conscious of the catastrophe. It is with a forced smile that she declares it is nothing, oh, not of the slightest consequence. That unlucky peach, how many blunders, how many pauses, how many absent-minded remarks it occasions. She makes the most frenzied attempts to regain her former gaiety, but in vain. Her gloves are stained and sticky with the flowing juice, and she is oppressed by the conviction that all her partners for the rest of the evening will hate her most heartily. An expression of real vexation steals over her pretty face, and she gives up her plate to one of the attendant beaux, with not so much as a wish that he will return to her. Where are the arch smiles, the lively tones, the quick and ready response now? Her spirit is quenched. Her manner has become subdued, depressed, shall I say, yes, even sulky. Ah, I see your courage will not brave laughter. You steal to the table, half ashamed of yourself, as you set down your untasted peach. Your sudden zeal to relieve those ladies of their plates serves as a very good excuse for the relinquishment of your own. You have rescued yourself very well from your dilemma this time. Remember my advice for the future. Never accept a peach in company. Miseries number 2 A dark night. There are some people who seem to have the faculty which horses and dogs are said to possess of seeing in the dark. But I, alas, am blind and blundering as a beetle. I never can find my way about house in the evening without a lamp to illumine my path. Many smarting remembrances have I of bruised nose and black eyes, the consequences of attempting to run through a partition, under the full conviction that I have arrived at an open door. My most prominent feature has been rudely assailed, also by doors standing ajar unexpectedly, which I have embraced with both outstretched arms. Crickets, tables, chairs, especially chairs with very sharp rockers, and other movable articles of furniture have stationed themselves, as it would seem, with malicious intent to trip me up. Some murderous contusion makes me suddenly conscious of their presence, then a feeling of complete bewilderment and helplessness and timidity comes over me. I have not the least idea in what part of the room I am. I am oppressed with a sense of chairs scattered about in improbable places. I long most ardently for a lamp, or only for one gleam from a neighbor's window. It is no rare thing for me to discover by a thrilling touch upon the cold glass that I have been feeling my way exactly in the opposite direction from what I imagined. Strange how ideas of direction and distance are lost when the sight is powerless. Touch may find out mistakes, but cannot always prevent them. Touch may convince me that I have arrived at my bureau but it is too careless to perceive, what the poor straining eyes would have discovered at a glance, the open upper drawer that salutes my forehead as I stoop hastily to grasp the handles beneath. Touch is clumsy. It only serves to upset valuable plants, inkstands, solar lamps, etc., with an appalling crash, and then leaves me standing aghast in utter uncertainty as to the extent of the catastrophe. In such emergencies a rush for the stairs is the first impulse. Ah, but those stairs! I will pass over the startling plunge which begins my descent, the frantic snatch for the banisters, and the strange momentary doubt as to which foot must move first, like what a child may feel when learning to walk. All this only serves to render me so over-careful that when I actually arrive at the foot of the staircase, I cannot believe it until a loud scuff and the shock 
that follows the interruption of my expected descent assure me beyond a doubt there is nothing more exasperating than this unless it may be the corresponding disappointment in running upstairs when you raise your foot high in air and bring it down with an emphatic stamp exactly upon a level with the other but these are mere household experiences sad though they are i esteem them as nothing in comparison with my adventures out of doors in a dark night and especially in a night both dark and stormy i feel myself one of the most wretched beings in existence imagine a vessel lost in the wide ocean and without compass and you will have some faint idea of my perplexity discouragement and loneliness at such a time i have a strange propensity for shooting off into the gutter or for shouldering the fences under the impression that i am pursuing a straight course i go quite out of my way to trip over chance stones or to pick out choice bits of slippery ice i splash recklessly through deep puddles stumble over unfortunate scrapers walk unexpectedly into open cellars and lay my length upon wet stone doorsteps i start back at visions of posts looming up in the darkness and whitewashed fences and trees all of which would be quite unlikely to be standing in the middle of the sidewalk and which disappear at the first reasonable thought i run into harmless passengers as if i would knock the breath of life out of them and tangle our umbrellas together so fearfully that they spin round and round some time after their separation oh that umbrella of mine sometimes i hook it in the drooping branches of trees and losing my hold in the suddenness of the shock have the gratification of feeling it tip up and go down over my shoulder into the mud behind me its bone tips tap and scratch at the windows as i go by and scrape against the tall fences like fingers trying to catch at something to hold on by and stop my progress it hits a low branch, and its varnished handle slips through my woolen gloves, knocking my hat over my eyes, and extinguishing me for the time being, as if the night were not dark enough without. My friends, I could go on much longer with my complaints, but I feel that I have drawn upon your sympathies sufficiently for the present. You will be as glad to leave me at my own house-door as I am to find it. Miseries number 3 Twine under the general head of string, I might enumerate a long list of the world's miseries. Shoe-strings alone comprehend an amount of wretchedness which is but feebly described in the tragical story of Jemmy String. Bonnet-strings and apron-strings, dicky-strings and watch-guards, curtain-cord, bed-cord, and cod-line, each and all have furnished enough discomfort to make out a long, grumbling article. But I cannot linger to describe their treacherous desertions, when their services are most needed their unexpected weakness and their obstinate entanglements when time presses a certain pudding-bag string is commemorated in one of the beautiful couplets of mother goose's melodies i am sure you cannot have forgotten it nor the staring spotted cat that is there represented racing away with her booty that lamented pudding-bag string is but a type of strings in general they are fleeting possessions always hiding always misplaced never in order you fit up a string drawer, perhaps, with a fine assortment, and pride yourself upon its nice arrangement. Go to it a week after, and see if you can find one ball where you left it. Can you lay your hand upon a single piece that you want? No, indeed. Twine is considered common property. If any one has a use for it, he takes it without leave or license, without even inquiring who is the owner, and you may be sure he will never bring any of it back again oh the misery endured for the want of an errant piece of twine when you are in a nervous hurry to do up a parcel some one waiting at the door meanwhile after an immense deal of pains you have it at last folded to your liking with every corner squared and even every wrinkle smoothed then clasping tightly with one hand the stiff wrapper you search distractedly with the other for a ball of twine which you distinctly remember tossing into the paper drawer only the day before in vain you surround yourself with newspaper and brown paper and useless rubbish tumbling your whole drawer into confusion in vain you relinquish your nicely packed parcel and see its contents scattered in all directions in vain you grumble and scold the ball is not forthcoming 
your little brother has seized it to fly his kite, or your sister is even now tying up her trailing morning glories or sweet peas with the stolen booty. You plunge your hand exploringly into the drawer and bring up a long roll wound thickly with twine of all kinds and colors. Your eyes sparkle at the prize, but, alas, the first energetic pull leaves in your hand a piece about four inches long, and a quantity of dangling ends and rough knots convince you that you have nothing to hope in that quarter. A second plunge brings up a handful of odds and ends, strong pieces, clumsy and rough, coarse red quill cord, delicate two-colored bits, far too short, cotton twine breaking at a touch, fine long pieces hopelessly tangled together, so that not even an end is visible. The more you twitch at the loops, the more desperate is the snarl. Poor mortal! Your pride gives way before the urgency of haste. You send off your nice package, miserably tied together by two kinds of twine. All the rest of the day you are tormented by a superfluity of the very thing you needed so much. It was impossible to get it when you wanted it, but now it is pertinaciously in your way when you do not want it. You almost break your neck, tripping over a long, firm cord, which proves to be a pair of reins left hanging on a chair by some careless urchin. The carpet and furniture are strewed with long, straggling pieces of pack-thread. You find a white end dangling conspicuously from your waistcoat pocket. As you walk the streets, you see twine flying from fences or lying useless on the sidewalk, black with dust and age. To crown the whole, a friend comes with a piece of twine extending across two rooms and asks you to help him twist and double it into a cord. It is a very entertaining process. You amuse yourself with watching one little rough place that whirls swiftly round, stops with a jerk, turns hesitatingly one side and the other, then yielding to a new impulse flies round and round again till you are dizzy. You look with great complacency at the tightening twist, now brought almost to perfection. You turn it carelessly in your fingers, scarcely noticing its convulsive starts for freedom. Ah, your imprudent friend, without any warning, gives it a final pull to stretch it into shape. The twine slips from your grasp, springs away across the room, curls itself into a succession of snarls and twisted loops, and then lies motionless. Your friend looks thunderstruck. With a hasty apology, you step forward and tightly clasp the recreant end. You are in nervous expectation of dropping it again. Your fingers are benumbed at the tips with their tight compression and the constant twitching. They give a sudden jerk. You make an involuntary clutch after the cord, but in vain. It is rapidly untwisting at the very feet of your companion, who looks at it in despair. Again, you make an attempt with no success at all, the refractory twine eluding your utmost endeavors to hold it. Once more, your fellow twister walks off at last with a wretchedly rough affair, which he good-humoredly says will do very well. Miseries, number four. I believe the world has gone quite crazy on the subject of fresh air. In the next century, people will think they must sleep on the housetops, I suppose, or camp out in tents in primitive style. Nothing is talked about but ventilators and air tubes and chimney draughts. One would suppose that fireplaces were invented expressly for cooling and airing a room instead of heating it. There was no such fuss when I was young. In those good old times, these airy notions had not come into fashion. Where the loose window sashes rattled at every passing breeze and the wind chased the smoke down the wide-mouthed chimney, nobody complained of being stifled. There were no furnaces then to spread a summer heat to every corner of the house. No, indeed. We ran shivering through the long, windy entries, all wrapped in shawls and hugging ourselves to retain the friendly warmth of the fire as long as possible. Far from devising ways of letting in the air, we tried hard to keep it out by stuffing the cracks with cotton and closely curtaining the windows in bed. Even then, the ice in the wash basin and the electricity which made our hair literally stand on end in the process of combing and the gradual transformation of fingers into thumbs showed but too plainly that the wintry air had penetrated our defenses. 
when we crowded joyfully round a crackling, sparkling wood fire, even while our faces glowed with the intense heat, cold shivers were creeping down our backs, and sudden draughts from an opening door set our teeth chattering. I often wished myself on a spit to revolve slowly before the fire until thoroughly roasted. Not from any want of air, I assure you, we children were always breaking panes of glass in the bitterest days, and the glazier was never known to come under a week to replace them. Why people should wish to revive and live through again the miseries of such a frost-nipped childhood I cannot imagine. I, for one, love a snug house, even a warm house. I am of a chilly temperament and subject to rheumatism, horrible colds, etc. Fresh air is my bane. I banish all books on the subject from my table. I studiously avoid all notorious fresh air lovers, or try in every way to bring over the poor misguided mortals to my views. But it is of no use. Fresh air is the fashion, and is run to extremes, as all fashions must be. I call in a physician. Lo, fresh air is recommended as a tonic. I give a party. Of course, my windows are all thrown open, and foolish young girls in the thinnest of white muslins are standing in the draught, and such a whirlwind is raised by the flirting of fans and the rush of the dancers that I am blown like a dry leaf into a corner where I stand shivering and making rueful attempts to appear smiling and hospitable. I go out to pass a social afternoon with a friend, and am set down in a room just above the freezing point, with a little crack opened in the window, and all the doors flying to change the air. I ride in the omnibus, and am almost choked with my bonnet strings. Such a furious draught meets me in the face, and then, with infinite pains, I have secured the only tolerably warm corner. My next neighbor becomes very faint, and must have the window open. Even the poor babies are not safe from this popular insanity. You may see the little victims any day taking an airing, with their little red noses and watery eyes peeping forth from under the caps and feathers. The old-fashioned blanket, in which the baby was done up head and all like a bundle, is thrown aside. The child is now quite so often carried upside down, I suppose under the new system, but what difference does it make whether the poor thing is smothered or frozen to death? I never shall forget a long journey I took once with a friend, who was raving mad on the subject of fresh air and cold water. Every morning the windows were thrown wide open, and the blinds flung back with an energetic bang, while a stiff wintry wind whirled everything about the room, and flapped the curtains against the ceiling. And there she stood, declaring herself exhilarated, while her nose and lips turned from red to blue, and the tears ran down her cheeks. I always took to flight. Afterwards the poor auto-martyr went out to walk before breakfast, scornfully rejecting all offers of furs and extra wrappings. Oh, dear, no, she never thought of muffs, tippets, snow-boots, but as encumbrances fit for extreme old age and infirmity. She always walked fast, and the more the wind blew, the warmer she felt, I might be assured. As soon as she had gone, I established myself in comfort by the side of a glowing grate happy but for dreading her return. She came in dreadfully fresh and breezy from the outer air, very energetic, very noisy, and fully bent upon stirring me up and making me take exercise. After snapping the door open and slamming it behind her with a clap that greatly disturbed my nerves, she exclaimed in a stentorian voice, Oh, dear me, I shall die in such an oven. My dear child, you have no idea how hot it is and the first thing I knew, up would go a window with a crash that made the weights rattle. It might rain or shine, weather made no difference to this inveterate air-seeker. Many a time has she come in all dripping and tracking the carpet, brushed carelessly against me with her wet garments, and finally enveloped me with the steam arising from them as they hung around my fire. It roused my indignation that she should make herself and everybody else so uncomfortable, and then glory in the deed as if it were indubitably and indisputably praiseworthy. She was so good-natured, however, and so happy in her delusion, that I could not find it in my heart to remonstrate very vehemently, except when she would make me listen to her interminable lectures upon the importance, the necessity, of fresh air, and the effect of a snug, cosy room upon the blood, the heart, the lungs, the head, and, as I verily believe she hinted, the temper. 
I know I lost control of mine long before she finished, but whether it was the want of fresh air and practice, or too much of it in theory, I leave you to imagine. My friend always carried a small thermometer in her trunk, which she consulted a dozen times an hour, in order to regulate the temperature of the room. Alas for me, if the quicksilver rose above sixty, I devoutly hoped she would leave it behind in some of our numerous stopping places, and with an eye to that possibility, I must confess, I hung it in the most out-of-the-way corners I could find, but it seemed to be in her mind continually. She never forgot it, and always packed it very carefully, too. I asked her two or three times to let me put it in my trunk, where I had slyly arranged a nice little place full of hard surfaces and sharp corners, but she always had plenty of room. I believe my zealous friend is now residing at the seashore, freezing in the cold sea winds, and losing her breath every morning in the briny wave, under the strange illusion that she is improving her health. End of Miseries from Autumn Leaves by Various Authors Edited by Anne Wales Abbott The Oath in Law of Hippocrates by Hippocrates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. The Oath and Law of Hippocrates. Introductory Note by Charles W. Eliot. Hippocrates, the celebrated Greek physician, was a contemporary of the historian Herodotus. He was born in the island of Kos between 470 and 460 B.C., and belonged to the family that claimed descent from the mythical Esculapius, son of Apollo. There was already a long medical tradition in Greece before his day, and this he is supposed to have inherited chiefly through his predecessor Herodicus, and he enlarged his education by extensive travel. He is said, though the evidence is unsatisfactory, to have taken part in the efforts to check the great plague which devastated Athens at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War. He died at Larissa between 380 and 360 B.C. The works attributed to Hippocrates are the earliest extant Greek medical writings, but very many of them are certainly not his. Some five or six, however, are generally granted to be genuine, and among these is the famous oath. This interesting document shows that in his time, physicians were already organized into a corporation or guild, with regulations for the training of disciples, and with an esprit de corps and a professional ideal which, with slight exceptions, can hardly yet be regarded as out of date. One saying occurring in the words of Hippocrates has achieved universal currency, though few who quote it today are aware that it originally referred to the art of the physician. It is the first of his aphorisms. Quote, Life is short and the art long, the occasion fleeting, experience fallacious, and judgment difficult. The physician must not only be prepared to do what is right himself, but also to make the patient, the attendants, and externals cooperate. Unquote. The Oath of Hippocrates I swear by Apollo the physician, and Esculapius, and health, and all heal, and all the gods and goddesses, that, according to my ability and judgment, I will keep this oath and this stipulation, to reckon him who taught me this art equally dear to me as my parents, to share my substance with him, and relieve his necessities if required, to look upon his offspring in the same footing as my own brothers, and to teach them this art if they shall wish to learn it, without fee or stipulation, and that by precept, lecture, and every other mode of instruction, I will impart a knowledge of the art to my own sons, and those of my teachers, and to disciples bound by a stipulation and oath according to the law of medicine, but to none others. I will follow that system of regimen which, according to my ability and judgment, I consider for the benefit of my patients, and abstain from whatever is deleterious and mischievous. I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked, nor suggest any such counsel, and in like manner I will not give to a woman a pessary to produce abortion. With purity and with holiness I will pass my life and practice my art. I will not cut persons laboring under the stone, but will leave this to be done by men who are practitioners of this work. 
Into whatever houses I enter, I will go into them for the benefit of the sick, and will abstain from every voluntary act of mischief and corruption, and further from the seduction of females or males, of freemen and slaves. Whatever, in connection with my professional practice, or not in connection with it, I see or hear in the life of men, which ought not to be spoken of abroad, I will not divulge, as reckoning that all such should be kept secret." While I continue to keep this oath unviolated, may it be granted to me to enjoy life in the practice of the art, respected by all men in all times. But should I trespass and violate this oath, may the reverse be my lot. The Law of Hippocrates 1. Medicine is of all the arts the most noble but, owing to the ignorance of those who practice it, and of those who inconsiderately form a judgment of them, it is at present far behind all the other arts. Their mistake appears to me to arise principally from this, that in the cities there is no punishment connected with the practice of medicine, and with it alone except disgrace, and that does not hurt those who are familiar with it. Such persons are like the figures which are introduced in tragedies, for as they have the shape and dress and personal appearance of an actor, but are not actors, so also physicians are many in title, but very few in reality. 2. Whoever is to acquire a competent knowledge of medicine ought to be possessed of the following advantages, a natural disposition, instruction, a favorable position for the study, early tuition, love of labor, leisure. First of all, a natural talent is required, for when nature leads the way to what is most excellent, instruction in the art takes place, which the student must try to appropriate to himself by reflection, becoming an early pupil in a place well adapted for instruction. He must also bring to the task a love of labor and perseverance, so that the instruction taking root may bring forth proper and abundant fruits. 3. Instruction in medicine is like the culture of the productions of the earth. For our natural disposition is, as it were, the soil. The tenets of our teacher are, as it were, the seed. Instruction in youth is like planting of the seed in the ground at the proper season. The place where the instruction is communicated is like the food imparted to vegetables by the atmosphere. Diligent study is like the cultivation of the fields. And it is time which imparts strength to all things and brings them to maturity. 4. Having brought all these requisites to the study of medicine, and having acquired a true knowledge of it, we shall thus, in traveling through the cities, be esteemed physicians not only in name, but in reality. But inexperience is a bad treasure, and a bad fund to those who possess it, whether in opinion or reality, being devoid of self-reliance and contentedness, and the nurse both of timidity and audacity. For timidity betrays a want of powers, and audacity a lack of skill. They are, indeed, two things, knowledge and opinion, of which the one makes its possessor really to know, the other to be ignorant. 5. Those things which are sacred are to be imparted only to sacred persons, and it is not lawful to impart them to the profane until they have been initiated in the mysteries of the science. End of The Oath and Law of Hippocrates Obstacle Cause by Frederick Bastiat Taken from Sophisms of the Protectionists This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 2. Obstacle Cause The obstacle mistaken for the cause, scarcity mistaken for abundance. The sophism is the same. It is well to study it under every aspect. Man naturally is in a state of entire destitution. Between this state and the satisfying of his wants, there exists a multitude 
of obstacles, which it is the object of labor to surmount. It is interesting to seek how and why he could have been led to look even upon these obstacles to his happiness as the cause of it. I wish to take a journey of some hundred miles, but between the point of my departure and my destination there are interposed mountains, rivers, swamps, forests, robbers, in a word, obstacles, and to conquer these obstacles it is necessary that I should bestow much labor and great efforts in opposing them, or what is the same thing if others do it for me, I must pay them the value of their exertions. It is evident that I should have been better off had these obstacles never existed. Through the journey of life, in the long series of days from the cradle to the tomb, man has many difficulties to oppose him in his progress. Hunger, thirst, sickness, heat, cold, are so many obstacles scattered along his road. In a state of isolation, he would be obliged to combat them all by hunting, fishing, agriculture, spinning, weaving, architecture, etc. And it is very evident that it would be better for him that these difficulties should exist to a less degree or even not at all. In a state of society, he is not obliged, personally, to struggle with each of these obstacles, but others do it for him, and he in return must remove some one of them for the benefit of his fellow men. Again, it is evident that, considering mankind as a whole, it would be better for society that these obstacles should be as weak and as few as possible. But if we examine closely and in detail the phenomena of society and the private interests of men as modified by exchange of produce, we perceive without difficulty how it has happened that wants have been confounded with riches, and the obstacle with the cause. The separation of occupations which results from the habits of exchange causes each man, instead of struggling against all surrounding obstacles, to combat only one, the effort being made not for himself alone, but for the benefit of his fellows, who in their turn render a similar service to him. Now it hence results that this man looks upon the obstacle which he has made it his profession to combat, for the benefit of others, as the immediate cause of his riches. The greater, the more serious, the more stringent may be his obstacle, the more he is remunerated for the conquering of it by those who are relieved by his labors. A physician, for instance, does not busy himself in baking his bread or in manufacturing his clothing and his instruments. Others do it for him and he, in return, combats the maladies with which his patients are afflicted. The more dangerous and frequent these maladies are, the more others are willing, the more even are they forced to work in his service. Disease, then, which is an obstacle to the happiness of mankind, becomes to him 
the source of his comforts. The reasoning of all producers is, in what concerns themselves, the same. As the doctor draws his profits from disease, so does the shipowner from the obstacles called distance, the agriculturalist from that named hunger, the cloth manufacturer from cold. The schoolmaster lives upon ignorance, the jeweler upon vanity, the lawyer upon quarrels, the notary upon breach of faith. Each profession has then an immediate interest in the continuation even in the extension of the particular obstacle to which its attention has been directed. Theorists hence go on to found a system upon these individual interests and say, wants are riches, labor is riches, the obstacle to well-being is well-being. To multiply obstacles is to give food to industry. Then comes the statesman. And as the developing and propagating of obstacles is the developing and propagating of riches, what more natural than that he should bend his efforts to that point? He says, for instance, if we prevent a large importation of iron, we create a difficulty in procuring it. This obstacle, severely felt, obliges individuals to pay in order to relieve themselves from it. A certain number of our citizens giving themselves up to the combating of this obstacle will thereby make their fortunes. In proportion, too, as the obstacle is great and the mineral scarce, inaccessible and of difficult and distant transportation, in the same proportion will be the number of laborers maintained by the various branches of this industry. The same reasoning will lead to the suppression of machinery. Here are men who are at a loss how to dispose of their wine harvest. This is an obstacle which other men set about removing for them by the manufacture of casks. It is fortunate, say our statesmen, that this obstacle exists, since it occupies a portion of the labor of the nation, and enriches a certain number of our citizens. But here is presented to us an ingenious machine, which cuts down the oak, squares it, makes it into staves, and gathering these together, forms them into cask. The obstacle is thus diminished, and with it the profits of the coopers. We must prevent this. Let us proscribe the machine. To sift thoroughly this sophism, it is sufficient to remember that human labor is not an end, but a means. It is never without employment. If one obstacle is removed, it seizes another, and mankind is delivered from two obstacles by the same effort which was at first necessary for one. If the labor of coopers becomes useless, it must take another direction. But with what, it may be asked, will they be remunerated? Precisely with what they are at present remunerated. For if a certain quantity of labor becomes free from its original occupation, to be otherwise disposed of, a corresponding quantity of wages must thus also become free. 
to maintain that human labor can end by wanting employment, it would be necessary to prove that mankind will cease to encounter obstacles. In such a case, labor would be not only impossible, it would be superfluous. We should have nothing to do, because we should be all-powerful, and our fiat alone would satisfy at once our wants and our desires. End of Obstacle Cause by Frederick Bastiat Recording by Robert Scott Mojo Move 411.com M O J O M O V E 411.com September the 1st, 2007Our Children and Great Discoveries by Mark Twain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Children and Great Discoveries a speech by Mark Twain, delivered at the Authors Club, New York. Our children, yours and mine, they seem like little things to talk about, our children, but little things often make up the sum of human life. That's a good sentence. I repeat it. Little things often produce great things. Now, to illustrate, take Sir Isaac Newton. I presume some of you have heard of Mr. Newton. Well, once Sir Isaac Newton, a mere lad, got over into a man's apple orchard. I don't know what he was doing there. I didn't come all the way from Hartford to question Mr. Newton's honesty. But when he was there, in the main orchard, he saw an apple fall, and he was attracted toward it, and that led to the discovery, not of Mr. Newton, but of the great law of attraction and gravitation. And there was once another great discoverer, I've forgotten his name, I don't remember what he discovered, but I know it was something very important, and I hope you will all tell your children about it when you get home. Well, when the great discoverer was once loafing around down in Virginia, and a puttin' in his time flirtin' with Pocahontas, oh, Captain John Smith, that was the man's name, and while he and Polka were sitting in Mr. Pohanton's garden, he accidentally put his arm around her and picked some simple weed, which proved to be tobacco, and now we find it in every Christian family, shedding its civilizing influence broadcast throughout the whole religious community. Now there was another great man, I can't think of his name either, who used to loaf around and watch the great chandelier in the cathedral at Pisa, which set him to thinking about the great law of gunpowder, and eventually led to the discovery of the cotton gin. Now I don't say this as an inducement for our young men to loaf around like Mr. Newton and Mr. Galileo and Captain Smith, but they were once little babies two days old, and they show what little things have sometimes accomplished. End of Our Children and Great Discoveries by Mark Twain Recording by Robert Scott, 
mojo move four one one dot com m o j o m o v e four one one dot com august twenty fifth two thousand and seven The Rise and Progress of Paleontology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Progress of Paleontology by Thomas Henry Huxley. Essay number two from Science and Hebrew Tradition. That application of the sciences of biology and geology, which is commonly known as paleontology, took its origin in the mind of the first person who, finding something like a shell, or a bone, naturally embedded in gravel or rock, indulged in speculations upon the nature of this thing which he had dug out, this fossil, and upon the causes which had brought it into such a position. In this rudimentary form, a high antiquity may safely be ascribed to paleontology, inasmuch as we know that, five hundred years before the Christian era, the philosophic doctrines of Xenophanes were influenced by his observations upon the fossil remains exposed in the quarries of Syracuse. From this time forth, not only the philosophers, but the poets, the historians, the geographers of antiquity, occasionally refer to fossils, and, after the revival of learning, lively controversies arose respecting their real nature but hardly more than two centuries have elapsed since this fundamental problem was first exhaustively treated. It was only in the last century that the archaeological value of fossils, their importance, I mean, as records of the history of the earth, was fully recognized. The first adequate investigation of the fossil remains of any large group of vertebrated animals is to be found in Cuvier's Recherche sur les ossements fossiles, completed in 1822, and so modern is stratigraphical paleontology that its founder, William Smith, lived to receive the just recognition of his services by the award of the first Wollaston Medal in 1831. But although paleontology is a comparatively youthful scientific specialty, the mass of materials with which it has to deal is already prodigious. In the last fifty years the number of known fossil remains of invertebrated animals has been trebled or quadrupled. The work of interpretation of vertebrate fossils, the foundations of which were so solidly laid by Cuvier, was carried on with wonderful vigor and success by Agassi in Switzerland, by von Meyer in Germany, and last but not least by Owen in this country, while in later years a multitude of workers have labored in the same field. In many groups of the animal kingdom the number of fossil forms already known is as great as that of the existing species. In some cases it is much greater, and there are entire orders of animals of the existence of which we should know nothing except for the evidence afforded by fossil remains. With all this it may be safely assumed that, at the present moment, we are not acquainted with the tittle of the fossils which will sooner or later be discovered. If we may judge by the profusion yielded within the last few years by the tertiary formations of North America, there seems to be no limit to the multitude of mammalian remains to be expected from that continent. An analogy leads us to expect similar riches in eastern Asia, whenever the tertiary formations of that region are as carefully explored. Again we have, as yet, almost everything to learn respecting the terrestrial population of the Mesozoic epoch, and it seems as if the western territories of the United States were about to prove as instructive in regard to this point as they have in respect of tertiary life. My friend, Professor Marsh, informs me that, within two years, remains of more than 160 distinct individuals of mammals, belonging to 20 species and 9 genera, have been found in a space not larger than the floor of a good-sized room, while beds of the same age have yielded 300 reptiles, varying in size from a length of 60 feet or 80 feet to the dimensions of a rabbit. The task which I have set myself tonight is to endeavor to lay before you, as briefly as possible, a sketch of the successive steps by which our present knowledge of the facts of paleontology and of those conclusions from them which are indisputable has been attained. And I beg leave to remind you, at the outset, that in attempting to sketch the progress of a branch of knowledge to which innumerable labors have contributed, my business is rather with generalizations than with details. 
It is my object to mark the epochs of paleontology, not to recount all the events of its history. That which I must now call the fundamental problem of paleontology, the question which has to be settled before any other can be profitably discussed, is this. What is the nature of fossils? Are they, as the healthy common sense of the ancient Greeks appears to have let them to assume without hesitation the remains of animals and plants? Or are they, as was so generally maintained in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, mere figured stones, portions of mineral matter which have assumed the forms of leaves and shells and bones, just as those portions of mineral matter which we call crystals take on the form of regular geometric solids? Or again, are they, as others thought, the products of the germs of animals and of the seeds of plants which have lost their way, as it were, in the bowels of the earth, and have achieved only an imperfect and abortive development? It is easy to sneer at our ancestors for being disposed to reject the first in favor of one or other of the last two hypotheses, but it is much more profitable to try to discover why they, who were really not one whit less sensible persons than our excellent selves, should have been led to entertain views which strike us as absurd. The belief in what is erroneously called spontaneous generation, that is to say, in the development of living matter out of mineral matter, apart from the agency of pre-existing living matter, as an ordinary occurrence at the present day, which is still held by some of us, was universally accepted as an obvious truth by them. They could point to the arborescent forms assumed by hoarfrost and by sundry metallic minerals as evidence of the existence in nature of a plastic force competent to enable inorganic matter to assume the form of organized bodies. Then, as everyone who is familiar with fossils knows, they present innumerable gradations, from shells and bones which exactly resemble the recent objects, to masses of mere stone which, however accurately they repeat the outward form of the organic body, have nothing else in common with it, and thence, to mere traces and faint impressions in the continuous substance of the rock. What we now know to be the results of the chemical changes which take place in the course of fossilization, by which mineral is substituted for organic substance, might, in the absence of such knowledge, be fairly interpreted as the expression of a process of development in the opposite direction, from the mineral to the organic. Moreover, in an age when it would have seemed the most absurd of paradoxes to suggest that the general level of the sea is constant, while that of the solid land fluctuates up and down through thousands of feet in a secular ground swell, it may well have appeared far less hazardous to conceive that fossils are sports of nature than to accept the necessary alternative, that all the inland regions and highlands, in the rocks of which marine shells had been found, had once been covered by the ocean. It is not so surprising, therefore, as it may seem at first, that although such men as Leonardo da Vinci and Bernard Palissy took just views of the nature of fossils, the opinion of the majority of their contemporaries set strongly the other way, nor even that error maintained itself long after the scientific grounds of the true interpretation of fossils had been stated, in a manner that left nothing to be desired, in the latter half of the seventeenth century. The person who rendered this good service to paleontology was Nicholas Steno, professor of anatomy in Florence, though a Dane by birth. Collectors of fossils at that day were familiar with certain bodies called glossopetrae, and speculation was rife as to their nature. In the first half of the seventeenth century, Fabio Colonna had tried to convince his colleagues of the famous Academia di Alincia that the glossopetrae were merely fossil shark's teeth, but his arguments made no impression. Fifty years later, Steno reopened the question, and by dissecting the head of a shark and pointing out the very exact correspondence of its teeth with the glossopetrae, left no rational doubt as to the origin of the latter. Thus far, the work of Steno went little further than that of Colonna, but it fortunately occurred to him to think out the whole subject of the interpretation of fossils, and the result of his meditations was the publication, in 1669, of a little treatise with the very quaint title of De Solido Entre Solidum Naturaliter Contento. The general course of Steno's argument may be stated in a few words. Fossils are solid bodies which, by some natural process, have come to be contained within other solid bodies, namely, the rocks in which they are embedded, and the fundamental problem of paleontology, stated generally, is this, quote, 
given a body endowed with a certain shape and produced in accordance with natural laws, to find in that body itself the evidence of the place and manner of its production. End quote. The only way of solving this problem is by the application of the axiom that quote, like effects imply like causes, unquote, or as Steno puts it, in reference to this particular case, that quote, bodies which are altogether similar have been produced in the same way. Unquote. Hence, since the glossopetrae are altogether similar to shark's teeth, they must have been produced by shark like fishes. And since many fossil shells correspond, down to the minutest details of structure, with the shells of existing marine or freshwater animals, they must have been produced by similar animals. And the like reasoning is applied by Steno to the fossil bones of vertebrated animals, whether aquatic or terrestrial. To the obvious objection that many fossils are not altogether similar to their living analogues, differing in substance while agreeing in form, or being mere hollows or impressions, the surfaces of which are figured in the same way as those of animal or vegetable organisms, Steno replies by pointing out the changes which take place in organic remains embedded in the earth, and how their solid substance may be dissolved away entirely, or replaced by mineral matter, until nothing is left of the original but a cast, an impression, or a mere trace of its contours. The principles of investigation thus excellently stated and illustrated by Steno in 1669 are those which have, consciously or unconsciously, guided the researches of paleontologists ever since. Even that feat of paleontology which has so powerfully impressed the popular imagination, the reconstruction of an extinct animal from a tooth or a bone, is based upon the simplest imaginable application of the logic of Steno. A moment's consideration will show, in fact, that Steno's conclusion that the glossopetrae are shark's teeth implies the reconstruction of an animal from its tooth. It is equivalent to the assertion that the animal, of which the glossopetrae are relics, had the form and organization of a shark, that it had a skull, a vertebral column, and limbs similar to those which are characteristic of this group of fishes, that its heart, gills, and intestines presented the peculiarities which those of all sharks exhibit. Nay, even any hard parts which its integument contained were of a totally different character from the scales of ordinary fishes. These conclusions are as certain as any based upon probable reasonings can be. And they are so, simply, because a very large experience justifies us in believing that teeth of this particular form and structure are invariably associated with the peculiar organization of sharks, and are never found in connection with other organisms. Why this should be, we are not at present in a position even to imagine. We must take the fact as an empirical law of animal morphology, the reason of which may possibly be one day found in the history of the evolution of the shark tribe, but for which it is hopeless to seek for an explanation in ordinary physiological reasonings. Everyone practically acquainted with paleontology is aware that it is not every tooth nor every bone which enables us to form a judgment of the character of the animal to which it belonged, and that it is possible to possess many teeth and even a large portion of the skeleton of an extinct animal, and yet be unable to reconstruct its skull or its limbs. It is only when the tooth or bone presents peculiarities, which we know by previous experience to be characteristic of a certain group, that we can safely predict that the fossil belonged to an animal of the same group. Anyone who finds a cow's grinder may be perfectly sure that it belonged to an animal which had two complete toes on each foot and ruminated. Anyone who finds a horse's grinder may be as sure that it had one complete toe on each foot and did not ruminate. But if ruminants and horses were extinct animals of which nothing but the grinders had ever been discovered, no amount of physiological reasoning could have enabled us to reconstruct either animal, still less to have divined the wide differences between the two. Cuvier, in the Discours sur la Révolution de la Surface du Globe, strangely credits himself, and has ever since been credited by others, with the invention of a new method of paleontological research. But if you will turn to the Recherche sur les ossements fossiles and watch Cuvier, not speculating but working, you will find that his method is neither more nor less than that of Steno. If he was able to make his famous prophecy from the jaw which lay upon the surface of a block of stone to the pelvis of the same animal 
which lay hidden in it, it was not because either he or anyone else knew or knows why a certain form of jaw is, as a rule, constantly accompanied by the presence of marsupial bones, but simply because experience has shown that these two structures are coordinated. The settlement of the nature of fossils led at once to the next advance in paleontology, viz. its application to the deciphering of the history of the earth. When it was admitted that fossils are remains of animals and plants, it followed that, in so far as they resemble terrestrial or freshwater animals and plants, they are evidences of the existence of land or fresh water, and in so far as they resemble marine organisms, they are evidences of the existence of the sea at the time they were parts of actually living animals and plants. Moreover, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, it must be admitted that the terrestrial or the marine organisms implied the existence of land or sea at the place in which they were found while they were yet living. In fact, such conclusions were immediately drawn by everybody, from the time of Xenophanes downwards, who believed that fossils were really organic remains. Steno discusses their value as evidence of repeated alteration of marine and terrestrial conditions upon the soil of Tuscany in a manner worthy of a modern geologist. The speculations of de Molay in the beginning of the 18th century turn upon fossils, and Buffon follows him very closely in those two remarkable works, the Theorie de la Terre and the Epoque de la Nature, with which he commenced and ended his career as a naturalist. The opening sentences of the Epoque de la Nature shows us how fully Buffon recognized the analogy of geological with archaeological inquiries. Quote, As in civil history we consult deeds, seek for coins, or decipher antique inscriptions in order to determine the epochs of human revolutions and fix the date of moral events, so in natural history we must search the archives of the world, recover old monuments from the bowels of the earth, collect their fragmentary remains, and gather into one body of evidence all the signs of physical change which may enable us to look back upon the different ages of nature. It is our only means of fixing some points in the immensity of space, and of setting a certain number of waymarks along the eternal path of time. Unquote. Buffon enumerates five classes of these monuments of the past history of the earth, and they are all facts of paleontology. In the first place, he says, shells and other marine productions are found all over the surface and in the interior of the dry land, and all calcareous rocks are made up of their remains. Secondly, a great many of these shells which are found in Europe are not now to be met with in the adjacent seas, and in the slates and other deep-seated deposits there are remains of fishes and of plants of which no species now exist in our latitudes, and which are either extinct or exist only in more northern climates. Thirdly, in Siberia and in other northern regions of Europe and of Asia, bones and teeth of elephants, rhinoceroses, and hippopotamuses occur in such numbers that these animals must once have lived and multiplied in those regions, although at the present day they are confined to southern climates. The deposits in which these remains are found are superficial, while those which contain shells and other marine remains lie much deeper. Fourthly, tusks and bones of elephants and hippopotamuses are found not only in the northern regions of the Old World, but also in those of the New World, although at present neither elephants nor hippopotamuses occur in America. Fifthly, in the middle of the continents, in regions most remote from the sea, we find an infinite number of shells, of which the most part belong to animals of those kinds which still exist in southern seas, but of which many others have no living analogues, so that these species appear to be lost, destroyed by some unknown cause. It is needless to inquire how far these statements are strictly accurate. They are sufficiently so to justify Buffon's conclusions that the dry land was once beneath the sea, that the formation of the fossiliferous rocks must have occupied a vastly greater lapse of time than that traditionally ascribed to the age of the earth, that fossil remains indicate different climatal conditions to have obtained in former times, and especially that the polar regions were once warmer, that many species of animals and plants have become extinct, and that geological change has had something to do with geographical distribution. But these propositions almost constitute the framework of paleontology. In order to complete it, but one addition was needed, 
and that was made in the last years of the eighteenth century by William Smith, whose work comes so near to our own times that many living men may have been personally acquainted with him. This modest land surveyor, whose business took him into many parts of England, profited by the peculiarly favorable conditions offered by the arrangement of our secondary strata to make a careful examination and comparison of their fossil contents at different points of the large area over which they extend. The result of his accurate and widely extended observations was to establish the important truth that each stratum contains certain fossils which are peculiar to it, and that the order in which the strata, characterized by these fossils, are superimposed one upon the other, is always the same. This most important generalization was rapidly verified and extended to all parts of the world accessible to geologists and now it rests upon such an immense mass of observations as to be one of the best established truths of natural science. To the geologist, the discovery was of infinite importance, as it enabled him to identify rocks of the same relative age, however their continuity might be interrupted or their composition altered. But to the biologist it had a still deeper meaning, for it demonstrated that, throughout the prodigious duration of time registered by the fossiliferous rocks, the living population of the earth had undergone continual changes, not merely by the extinction of a certain number of the species which had at first existed, but by the continual generation of new species, and the no less constant extinction of old ones. Thus the broad outlines of paleontology, in so far as it is the common property of both the geologist and the biologist, were marked out at the close of the last century. In tracing its subsequent progress, I must confine myself to the province of biology, and indeed to the influence of paleontology upon zoological morphology. And I accept this limitation the more willingly, as the no less important topic of the bearing of geology and of paleontology upon distribution has been luminously treated in the address of the President of the Geographical Section. The succession of the species of animals and plants in time being established the first question which the zoologist or the botanist had to ask himself was, what is the relation of these successive species one to another? And is it a curious circumstance that the most important event in the history of paleontology, which immediately succeeded William Smith's generalization, was a discovery which, could it have been rightly appreciated at the time, would have gone far toward suggesting the answer, which was in fact delayed for more than half a century? I refer to Cuvier's investigation of the mammalian fossils yielded by the quarries in the older tertiary rocks of Montmartre, among the chief results of which was the bringing to light of two genera of extinct hoofed quadrupeds, the Anoplotherium and the Paleotherium. The rich materials at Cuvier's disposition enabled him to obtain a full knowledge of the osteology and of the dentition of these two forms, and consequently to compare their structure critically with that of existing hoofed animals. The effect of this comparison was to prove that the anoplotherium, though it presented many points of resemblance with the pigs on the one hand and with the ruminants on the other, differed from both to such an extent that it could find a place in neither group. In fact, it held in some respects an intermediate position, tending to bridge over the interval between these two groups, which in the existing fauna are so distinct. In the same way, the paleotherium tended to connect forms so different as the tapir, the rhinoceros, and the horse. Subsequent investigations have brought to light a variety of facts of the same order, the most curious and striking of which are those which prove the existence in the Mesozoic epoch of a series of forms intermediate between birds and reptiles, two classes of vertebrate animals which at present appear to be more widely separated than any others. Yet the interval between them is completely filled, in the Mesozoic fauna, by birds which have reptilian characters on the one side, and reptiles which have ornithic characters on the other. So again, while the group of fishes termed ganoids is, at the present time, so distinct from that of the dipnoi or mudfishes, that they have been reckoned as distinct orders, the Devonian strata present us with forms of which it is impossible to say with certainty whether they are dipnoi or whether they are ganoids. Agassiz's long and elaborate researches upon fossil fishes, published between 1833 and 1842, led him to suggest the existence of another kind of relation between ancient and modern forms of life. 
he observed that the oldest fishes present many characters which recall the embryonic conditions of existing fishes, and that, not only among fishes, but in several groups of the invertebrata, which have a long paleontological history, the latest forms are more modified, more specialized, than the earlier. The fact that the dentition of the older tertiary ungulate and carnivorous mammals is always complete, noticed by Professor Owen, illustrated the same generalization. Another no less suggestive observation was made by Mr. Darwin, whose personal investigations during the voyage of the Beagle led him to remark upon the singular fact that the fauna, which immediately precedes that at present existing in any geographical province of distribution, presents the same peculiarities as its successor. Thus, in South America and in Australia, the later tertiary or quaternary fossils show that the fauna which immediately preceded that of the present day was, in the one case, as much characterized by edentates, and in the other by marsupials, as it is now, although the species of the older are largely different from those of the newer fauna. However clearly these indications might point in one direction, the question of the exact relation of the successive forms of animal and vegetable life could be satisfactorily settled only in one way, namely, by comparing, stage by stage, the series of forms presented by one and the same type throughout a long space of time. Within the last few years this has been done fully in the case of the horse, less completely in the case of the other principal types of the ungulata and of the carnivora, and all these investigations tend to one general result, namely, that in any given series, the successive members of that series present a gradually increasing specialization of structure. That is to say, if any such mammal at present existing has specially modified and reduced limbs or dentition and complicated brain, its predecessors in time show less and less modification and reduction in limbs and teeth, and a less highly developed brain. The labors of Gowdry, Marsh, and Cope furnish abundant illustrations of this law from the marvelous fossil wealth of Pekermi and the vast uninterrupted series of tertiary rocks in the territories of North America. I will now sum up the results of this sketch of the rise and progress of paleontology. The whole fabric of paleontology is based upon two propositions. The first is that fossils are the remains of animals and plants. The second is that the stratified rocks in which they are found are sedimentary deposits, and each of these propositions is founded upon the same axiom, that like effects imply like causes. If there is any cause competent to produce a fossil stem, or shell, or bone, except a living being, then paleontology has no foundation. If the stratification of the rocks is not the effect of such causes as at present produce stratification, we have no means of judging of the duration of past time, or of the order in which the forms of life have succeeded one another. But if these two propositions are granted, there is no escape, as it appears to me, from three very important conclusions. The first is that living matter has existed upon the earth for a vast length of time, certainly for millions of years. The second is that, during this lapse of time, the forms of living matter have undergone repeated changes, the effect of which has been that the animal and vegetable population at any period of the Earth's history contains certain species which did not exist at some antecedent period, and others which ceased to exist at some subsequent period. The third is that, in the case of many groups of mammals and some of reptiles, in which one type can be followed through a considerable extent of geological time, the series of different forms by which the type is represented, at successive intervals of this time, is exactly such as it would be if they had been produced by the gradual modification of the earliest forms of the series. These are facts of the history of the earth guaranteed by as good evidence as any facts in civil history. Hitherto I have kept carefully clear of all the hypotheses to which men have at various times endeavored to fit the facts of paleontology or by which they have endeavored to connect as many of these facts as they happen to be acquainted with. I do not think it would be a profitable employment of our time to discuss conceptions which doubtless have had their justification and even their use, but which are now obviously incompatible with the well-ascertained truths of paleontology. At present these truths leave room for only two hypotheses. The first is that, in the course of the history of the earth, innumerable species of animals and plants have come into existence, independently of one another, innumerable times. 
This, of course, implies either that spontaneous generation on the most astounding scale, and of animals such as horses and elephants, has been going on as a natural process through all the time recorded by the fossiliferous rocks. Or it necessitates the belief in innumerable acts of creation repeated innumerable times. The other hypothesis is that the successive species of animals and plants have arisen, the latter by the gradual modification of the earlier. This is the hypothesis of evolution, and the paleontological discoveries of the last decade are so completely in accordance with the requirements of this hypothesis that, if it had not existed, the paleontologists would have had to invent it. I have always had a certain horror of presuming to set a limit upon the possibilities of things. Therefore, I will not venture to say that it is impossible that the multitudinous species of animals and plants may have been produced, one separately from the other, by spontaneous generation, nor that it is impossible that they should have been independently originated by an endless succession of miraculous creative acts. But I must confess that both these hypotheses strike me as so astoundingly improbable, so devoid of a shred of either scientific or traditional support, that even if there were no other evidence than that of paleontology in its favor, I should feel compelled to adopt the hypothesis of evolution. Happily, the future of paleontology is independent of all hypothetical considerations. Fifty years hence, whoever undertakes to record the progress of paleontology will note the present time as the epoch in which the law of succession of the forms of the higher animals was determined by the observation of paleontological facts. He will point out that, just as Steno and as Cuvier were enabled from their knowledge of the empirical laws of coexistence of the parts of animals to conclude from a part to the whole, so the knowledge of the law of succession of forms empowered their successors to conclude from one or two terms of such a succession to the whole series, and thus to divine the existence of forms of life of which, perhaps, no trace remains, at epochs of inconceivable remoteness in the past. End of the Rise and Progress of Paleontology by Thomas Henry Huxley Should Women Be Beautiful? From Idle Ideas in 1905 by Jerome K. Jerome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pretty women are going to have a hard time of it later on. Hitherto they have had things far too much their own way. In the future there are going to be no pretty girls, for the simple reason there will be no plain girls against which to contrast them. Of late I have done some systematic reading of ladies' papers. The plain girl submits to a course of treatment. In eighteen months she bursts upon society an acknowledged beauty, and it is all done by kindness. One girl writes, Only a little while ago I used to look at myself in the glass and cry. Now I look at myself and laugh. The letter is accompanied by two photographs of the young lady. I should have cried myself had I seen her as she was at first. She was a stumpy, flat-headed, squat-nosed, cross-eyed thing. She did not even look good. One virtue she appears to have had, however, it was faith. She believed what the label said. She did what the label told her. She is now a tall, ravishing young person, her only trouble being, I should say, to know what to do with her hair. It reaches to her knees and must be a nuisance to her. She would do better to give some of it away. Taking this young lady as a text, it means that the girl who declines to be a dream of loveliness does so out of obstinacy. What the raw material may be does not appear to matter. Provided no feature is absolutely missing, the result is one and the same. Arrived at years of discretion, the maiden proceeds to choose the style of beauty she prefers. Will she be a Juno, a Venus, or a Helen? Will she have a Grecian nose, or one tip-tilted like the petal of a rose? Let her try the tip-tilted style first. The professor has an idea it is going to be fashionable. If afterwards she does not like it, there will be time to try the Grecian. It is difficult to decide these points without experiment. Would the lady like a high or a low forehead? Some ladies like to look intelligent. It is purely a matter of taste. With the Grecian nose, the low, broad forehead perhaps goes better. It is more according to precedent. On the other hand, the high, brainy forehead would be more original. It is for the lady herself to select. We come to the question of eyes. 
The lady fancies a delicate blue, not too pronounced a colour, one of those useful shades that go with almost everything. At the same time there should be depth and passion. The professor understands exactly the sort of eye the lady means, but it will be expensive. There is a cheap quality, the professor does not recommend it. True that it passes muster by gaslight, but the sunlight shows it up. It lacks tenderness, and at the price you can hardly expect it to contain much hidden meaning. The professor advises the melting, Oh, George, take me in your arms, and still my foolish fears, brand. It costs a little more, but it pays for itself in the end. Perhaps it will be best, now the eye has been fixed upon, to discuss the questions of the hair. The professor opens his book of patterns. Maybe the lady is of a willful disposition. She loves to run laughing through the woods during exceptionally rainy weather, or to gallop across the downs without a hat, her fair ringlets streaming in the wind, the old family coachman panting and expostulating in the rear. If one may trust the popular novel, extremely satisfactory husbands have often been secured in this way. You naturally look at a girl who is walking through a wood laughing heartily apparently for no other reason than because it's raining, who rides at stretch gallop without a hat. If you have nothing else to do, you follow her. It is always on the cards that such a girl may do something really amusing before she gets home. Thus things begin. To a girl of this kind, naturally curly hair is essential. It must be the sort of hair that looks better when it is soaking wet. The bottle of stuff that makes this particular hair to grow may be considered dear if you think merely of the price, but that is not the way to look at it. What is it going to do for me? That's what the girl has to ask herself. It does not do to spoil the ship for a hapeth of tar, as the saying is. If you're going to be a dashing, willful beauty, you must have the hair for it, or the whole scheme falls to the ground. Eyebrows and eyelashes, the professor assumes, the lady would like to match the hair. Too much eccentricity the professor does not agree with. Nature, after all, is the best guide. Neatness combined with taste, that is the ideal to be aimed at. The eyebrows should be almost straight, the professor thinks. The eyelashes, long and silky, with just the suspicion of a curl. The professor would also suggest a little less cheekbone. Cheekbones are being worn low this season. Will the lady have a dimpled chin, or does she fancy the square-cut jaw? Maybe the square-cut jaw and the firm, sweet mouth are more suitable for the married woman. They go well enough with the baby and the tea-urn, and the strong, proud man in the background. For the unmarried girl, the dimpled chin and the rosebud mouth are, perhaps, on the whole, safer. Some gentlemen are so nervous of that firm, square jaw. For the present, at all events, let us keep to the rosebud and the dimple. Complexion. Well, there is only one complexion worth considering, a creamy white relieved by delicate peach pink. It goes with everything and is always effective. Rich olives, striking pallors, yes, you hear of these things doing well. The professor's experience, however, is that for all round work you will never improve upon the plain white and pink. It is less liable to get out of order, and is the easiest at all times to renew. For the figure, the professor recommends something lithe and supple. Five foot four is a good height, but that is a point that should be discussed first with the dressmaker. For trains, five foot six is perhaps preferable. But for the sporting girl who has to wear short frocks, that height would of course be impossible. The bust and the waist are also points on which the dressmaker should be consulted. Nothing should be done in a hurry. What is the fashion going to be for the next two or three seasons? There are styles demanding that, beginning at the neck, you should curve out like a pouter pigeon. There is apparently no difficulty whatever in obtaining this result. But if crinolines, for instance, are likely to come in again, the lady has only to imagine it for herself. The effect might be grotesque, suggestive of a walking hourglass. So too with the waist. For some fashions it is better to have it just a foot from the neck. At other times it is more useful lower down. The lady will kindly think over these details and let the professor know. While one is about it, one may as well make a sound job. It is all so simple, and when you come to think of it, really not expensive. Age apparently makes no difference. A woman is as old as she looks. In future, I take it, there will be no ladies over five and twenty. Wrinkles. Why any lady should still persist in wearing them is a mystery to me. With a moderate amount of care, any middle-class woman could save enough out of the housekeeping money in a month to get rid of every one of them. Grey hair? Well, of course, if you cling to grey hair, there is no more to be said. 
but to ladies who would just as soon have rich wavy brown or a delicate shade of gold i would point out that there are one hundred and forty seven inexpensive lotions on the market any one of which rubbed gently into the head with a toothbrush not too hard just before going to bed will to use a colloquialism do the trick are you too stout or are you too thin all you have to do is say which and enclose stamps but do not make a mistake and send for the wrong recipe if you are already too thin you might in consequence suddenly disappear before you found out your mistake one very stout lady i knew worked at herself for eighteen months and got stouter every day this discouraged her so much that she gave up trying no doubt she had made a muddle and had sent for the wrong bottle but she would not listen to further advice she said she was tired of the whole thing in future years there will be no need for a young man to look about him for a wife he will take the nearest girl tell her his ideal and if she really care for him she will go to the shop and have herself fixed up to his pattern in certain eastern countries i believe something of this kind is done a gentleman desirous of adding to his family sends round the neighbourhood the weight and size of his favourite wife hinting that if another can be found of the same proportions there is room for her fathers walk around among their daughters choose the most likely specimen and have her fattened up that is their brutal eastern way out west we shall be more delicate matchmaking mothers will probably revive the old confession book eligible bachelors will be invited to fill in a page your favourite height in women your favourite measurement round the waist do you like brunettes or blondes the choice will be left to the girls i do think henry william just too sweet for words the maiden of the future will murmur to herself gently coyly she will draw from him his ideal of what a woman should be in from six months to a year she will burst upon him the perfect she height size weight right to a t he will clasp her in his arms at last he will cry i have found her the woman of my dreams and if he does not change his mind and the bottles do not begin to lose their effect there will be every chance that they will be happy ever afterwards might not science go on even further why rest satisfied with making a world of merely beautiful women cannot science while she is about it make them all good at the same time i do not apologize for the suggestion i used to think all women beautiful and good it is their own papers that have disillusioned me i used to look at this lady or that shyly when nobody seemed to be noticing me and think how fair she was how stately now i only wonder who is her chemist they used to tell me when i was a little boy that girls were made of sugar and spice i know better now i have read the recipes in the answers to correspondence when i was quite a young man i used to sit in dark corners and listen with swelling heart while people at the piano told me where little girl babies got their wonderful eyes from of the things they did to them in heaven that gave them dimples ah oh, me i wish now that i had never come across those ladies papers i know the stuff that causes those bewitching eyes i know the shop where they make those dimples i have passed it and looked in i thought they were produced by angels kisses but there was not an angel about the place that i could see perhaps i have also been deceived as regards their goodness maybe all women are not so perfect as in the popular short story they appear to be that is why i suggest that science should proceed still further and make them all as beautiful in mind as she is now able to make them in body may we not live to see in the advertisement columns of the ladies papers of the future the portrait of a young girl sulking in a corner before taking the lotion the same girl dancing among her little brothers and sisters shedding sunlight through the home after the three first bottles may we not have the caudal mixture one tablespoon at bedtime guaranteed to make the lady murmur good night dear hope you'll sleep well and at once to fall asleep her lips parted in a smile maybe some specialist of the future will advertise mind massage warranted to remove from the most obstinate subject all traces of hatred envy and malice and when science has done everything possible for women there might be no harm in her turning her attention to us men her idea at present seems to be that we men are too beautiful physically and morally to need improvement personally there are one or two points about which i should like to consult her 
The End of Should Women Be Beautiful by Jerome K. Jerome Recorded by Peter Yearsley The Story of an Eyewitness by Jack London This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of an Eyewitness by Jack London, Collier's Special Correspondent. Collier's, The National Weekly, May 5, 1906. Upon receipt of the first news of the earthquake, Collier's telegraphed to Mr. Jack London, who lives only forty miles from San Francisco, requesting him to go to the scene of the disaster and write the story of what he saw. Mr. London started at once, and he sent the following dramatic description of the tragic events he witnessed in the burning city. The earthquake shook down in San Francisco hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of walls and chimneys, but the conflagration that followed burned up hundreds of millions of dollars worth of property. There is no estimating within hundreds of millions the actual damage wrought. Not in history has a modern imperial city been so completely destroyed. San Francisco is gone. Nothing remains of it but memories and a fringe of dwelling houses on its outskirts. Its industrial section is wiped out. Its business section is wiped out. Its social and residential section is wiped out. The factories and warehouses, the great stores and newspaper buildings, the hotels and the palaces of the nabobs are all gone. Remains only the fringe of dwelling houses on the outskirts of what was once San Francisco. Within an hour after the earthquake shock, the smoke of San Francisco's burning was a lurid tower visible a hundred miles away, and for three days and nights this lurid tower swayed in the sky, reddening the sun, darkening the day, and filling the land with smoke. On Wednesday morning at a quarter past five came the earthquake. A minute later the flames were leaping upward. In a dozen different quarters south of Market Street, in the working-class ghetto, and in the factories, fires started. There was no opposing the flames. There was no organization, no communication. All the cunning adjustments of a twentieth century city had been smashed by the earthquake. The streets were humped into ridges and depressions and piled with the debris of fallen walls. The steel rails were twisted into perpendicular and horizontal angles. The telephone and telegraph systems were disrupted, and the great water mains had burst. All the shrewd contrivances and safeguards of man had been thrown out of gear by thirty seconds twitching of the earth crust. The fire made its own draft. By Wednesday afternoon, inside of twelve hours, half the heart of the city was gone. At that time I watched the vast conflagration from out on the bay. It was dead calm. Not a flicker of wind stirred. Yet from every side wind was pouring in upon the city. East, west, north, and south strong winds were blowing upon the doomed city. The heated air rising made an enormous suck. Thus did the fire of itself build its own colossal chimney through the atmosphere. Day and night this dead calm continued, and yet, near to the flames, the wind was often half a gale, so mighty was the suck. Wednesday night saw the destruction of the very heart of the city. Dynamite was lavishly used, and many of San Francisco's proudest structures were crumbled by man himself into ruins but there was no withstanding the onrush of the flames. Time and again successful stands were made by the firefighters, and every time the flames flanked around on either side or came up from the rear and turned to defeat the hard-won victory. An enumeration of the buildings destroyed would be a directory of San Francisco. An enumeration of the buildings undestroyed would be a line and several addresses. An enumeration of the deeds of heroism would stock a library and bankrupt the Carnegie Medal Fund. An enumeration of the dead will never be made. All vestiges of them were destroyed by the flames. The number of the victims of the earthquake will never be known. South of Market Street, where the loss of life was particularly heavy, was the first to catch fire. Remarkable as it may seem, Wednesday night, while the whole city crashed and roared into ruin, was a quiet night. There were no crowds. There was no shouting and yelling. There was no hysteria, no disorder. I passed Wednesday night in the path of the advancing flames, and in all those terrible hours I saw not one woman who wept, not one man who was excited, 
not one person who was in the slightest degree panic-stricken. Before the flames, throughout the night, fled tens of thousands of homeless ones. Some were wrapped in blankets, others carried bundles of bedding and dear household treasures. Sometimes a whole family was harnessed to a carriage or delivery wagon that was weighted down with their possessions. Baby buggies, toy wagons, and go-carts were used as trucks, while every other person was dragging a trunk. Yet everybody was gracious, the most perfect courtesy obtained. Never in all San Francisco's history were her people so kind and courteous as on this night of terror. A CARAVAN OF TRUNKS All night these tens of thousands fled before the flames. Many of them, the poor people from the labor ghetto, had fled all day as well. They had left their homes burdened with possessions. Now and again they lightened up, flinging out upon the street clothing and treasures they had dragged for miles. They held on longest to their trunks, and over these trunks many a strong man broke his heart that night. The hills of San Francisco are steep, and upon these hills, mile after mile were the trunks dragged. Everywhere were trunks with across them lying their exhausted owners, men and women. Before the march of the flames were flung picket lines of soldiers, and a block at a time, as the flames advanced, these pickets retreated. One of their tasks was to keep the trunk pullers moving. The exhausted creatures, stirred on by the menace of bayonets, would arise and struggle up the steep pavements, pausing from weakness every five or ten feet. Often, after surmounting a heartbreaking hill, they would find another wall of flame advancing upon them at right angles, and be compelled to change anew the line of their retreat. In the end, completely played out, after toiling for a dozen hours like giants, thousands of them were compelled to abandon their trunks. Here the shopkeepers and soft members of the middle class were at a disadvantage, but the working men dug holes in vacant lots and backyards, and buried their trunks. THE DOOMED CITY At nine o'clock Wednesday evening I walked down through the very heart of the city. I walked through miles and miles of magnificent buildings and towering skyscrapers, here was no fire. All was in perfect order. The police patrolled the streets. Every building had its watchman at the door. And yet it was doomed, all of it. There was no water. The dynamite was giving out. And at right angles, two different conflagrations were sweeping down upon it. At one o'clock in the morning I walked down through the same section. Everything still stood intact. There was no fire. And yet there was a change. A rain of ashes was falling. The watchmen at the doors were gone. The police had been withdrawn. There were no firemen, no fire engines, no men fighting with dynamite. The district had been absolutely abandoned. I stood at the corner of Kearney and Market in the very innermost heart of San Francisco. Kearney Street was deserted. Half a dozen blocks away it was burning on both sides. The street was a wall of flame. And against this wall of flame, silhouetted sharply, were two United States cavalrymen sitting their horses, calmly watching. That was all. Not another person was in sight. In the intact heart of the city, two troopers sat their horses and watched. Spread of the Conflagration Surrender was complete. There was no water. The sewers had long since been pumped dry. There was no dynamite. Another fire had broken out further uptown, and now from three sides, Conflagrations were sweeping down. The fourth side had been burned earlier in the day. In that direction stood the tottering walls of the Examiner Building, the burned-out Call Building, the smoldering ruins of the Grand Hotel, and the gutted, devastated, dynamited Palace Hotel. The following will illustrate the sweep of the flames and the inability of men to calculate their spread. At eight o'clock Wednesday evening, I passed through Union Square. It was packed with refugees, Thousands of them had gone to bed on the grass. Government tents had been set up, supper was being cooked, and the refugees were lining up for free meals. At half-past one in the morning, three sides of Union Square were in flames. The fourth side, where stood the great St. Francis Hotel, was still holding out. An hour later, ignited from top and sides, the St. Francis was flaming heavenward. Union Square, heaped high with mountains of trunks, was deserted. Troops, refugees, and all had retreated. A Fortune for a Horse It was at Union Square that I saw a man offering a thousand dollars for a team of horses. He was in charge of a truck piled high with trunks from some hotel. It had been hauled here into what was considered safety, 
and the horses had been taken out. The flames were on three sides of the square, and there were no horses. Also at this time, standing beside the truck, I urged a man to seek safety in flight. He was all but hemmed in by several conflagrations. He was an old man, and he was on crutches. Said he, Today is my birthday. Last night I was worth thirty thousand dollars. I bought five bottles of wine, some delicate fish, and other things for my birthday dinner. I have had no dinner, and all I own are these crutches. I convinced him of his danger and started him limping on his way. An hour later, from a distance, I saw the truckload of trunks burning merrily in the middle of the street. On Thursday morning, at a quarter past five, just twenty-four hours after the earthquake, I sat on the steps of a small residence on Knob Hill. With me sat Japanese, Italians, Chinese, and Negroes, a bit of the cosmopolitan flotsam of the wreck of the city. All about were the palaces of the Nabob pioneers of forty-nine. To the east and south at right angles were advancing two mighty walls of flame. I went inside with the owner of the house on the steps of which I sat. He was cool and cheerful and hospitable. Yesterday morning, he said, I was worth six hundred thousand dollars. This morning this house is all I have left. It will go in fifteen minutes. He pointed to a large cabinet. That is my wife's collection of china. This rug upon which we stand is a present. It costs fifteen hundred dollars. Try that piano. Listen to its tone. There are few like it. There are no horses. The flames will be here in fifteen minutes. Outside the old Mark Hopkins residence, a palace was just catching fire. The troops were falling back and driving the refugees before them. From every side came the roaring of flames, the crashing of walls, and the detonations of dynamite. The Dawn of the Second Day I passed out of the house. Day was trying to dawn through the smoke pall. A sickly light was creeping over the face of things. Once only the sun broke through the smoke pall, blood red and showing quarter its usual size. The smoke pall itself, viewed from beneath, was a rose color that pulsed and fluttered with lavender shades, then it turned to mauve and yellow and dun. There was no sun, and so dawned the second day on stricken San Francisco. An hour later I was creeping past the shattered dome of the city hall. Then there was no better exhibit of the destructive force of the earthquake. Most of the stone had been shaken from the great dome, leaving standing the naked framework of steel. Market Street was piled high with the wreckage, and across the wreckage lay the overthrown pillars of the city hall, shattered into short crosswise sections. This section of the city, with the exception of the mint and the post office, was already a waste of smoking ruins. Here and there through the smoke, creeping warily under the shadows of tottering walls, emerged occasional men and women. It was like the meeting of the handful of survivors after the day of the end of the world. Beeves slaughtered and roasted. On Mission Street lay a dozen steers in a neat row stretching across the street just as they had been struck down by the flying ruins of the earthquake. The fire had passed through afterwards and roasted them. The human dead had been carried away before the fire came. At another place on Mission Street I saw a milk wagon. A steel telegraph pole had smashed down sheer through the driver's seat and crushed the front wheels. The milk cans lay scattered around. All day Thursday and all Thursday night, all day Friday and Friday night, the flames still raged on. Friday night saw the flames finally conquered, though not until Russian Hill and Telegraph Hill had been swept and three-quarters of a mile of wharves and docks had been licked up. THE LAST STAND the great stand of the firefighters was made Thursday night on Van Ness Avenue. Had they failed here, the comparatively few remaining houses of the city would have been swept. Here were the magnificent residences of the second generation of San Francisco nabobs, and these, in a solid zone, were dynamited down across the path of the fire. Here and there the flames leaped the zone, but these fires were beaten out, principally by the use of wet blankets and rugs. San Francisco, at the present time, is like the crater of a volcano around which are camped tens of thousands of refugees. At the Presidio alone are at least twenty thousand. All the surrounding cities and towns are jammed with the homeless ones, where they are being cared for by the relief committees. The refugees were carried free by the railroads to any point they wished to go, and it is estimated that over one hundred thousand people have left the peninsula on which San Francisco stood. The government has a situation in hand, 
and thanks to the immediate relief given by the whole United States, there is not the slightest possibility of a famine. The bankers and businessmen have already set about making preparations to rebuild San Francisco. End of the Story of an Eyewitness by Jack London Read by Leanne Howlett